thirteenth invocation, Mother of Christ, pray for us. We call Mary the mother not only of God but also of Christ in order to express more distinctly what the Son of God, born of her, is to us. Christ is our prophet. Moses even referred to him in these words, The Lord thy God will raise up to thee a prophet of thy nation and of the brethren like unto me. Him thou shalt hear. Christ was acknowledged as a prophet by the Jews. They said, A great prophet is risen up among us. How deplorable was the condition of mankind before the coming of Christ to this great prophet. The knowledge of God had almost entirely disappeared, and the most abominable idolatry prevailed. Men were so blinded that they could no longer, no longer distinguish between right and wrong, error and truth. The greatest crimes, such as theft, rapine, revenge, and suicide, were looked upon as permissible, and under certain circumstances, even as laudable deeds. Nay, they went so far as to believe that they could honor and venerate their deities by the most shameful debaucheries and crimes. Even the Jews were addicted to many errors. Their whole religious worship was a shell without a kernel. Christ, the great prophet, the teacher of truth, appears and enlightens those who were sitting in the darkness and shadow of death. He imparts to mankind the most wholesome instruction concerning God and his attributes, their relation to him, and what they have to hope and to fear hereafter. He teaches them their duties towards God, themselves, and their fellow men, and shows them the way in which they can arrive at the highest degree of virtue and sanctity. He acquaints them with all the means they must employ in order to live a life of holiness and to be saved. Christ exercises this office of prophet still, and will continue to exercise it to the end of the world. He has deposited the whole treasure of his revealed doctrine of salvation in the Catholic Church, and enabled her, through the indwelling of the Holy Ghost, to preserve and announce it in its purity to the end of time. The Catholic Church is the medium through which he announces the word of life to all the nations of the earth throughout all centuries. Thus Christ is our prophet. Oh, how much we should venerate Mary, who has brought forth so great a prophet. If it is a singular honor for a mother to have a renowned artist or a learned man for a son, how much more must we call Mary blessed, whose son is Christ, the light of the world, the son of justice, the prophet of all prophets. My dear Christian, thank God from your inmost heart that you are a member of the Catholic Church, wherein the light of truth shines in full resplendent brightness. Let it be your constant endeavor to increase your knowledge of the Christian truth, and to this end attend High Mass on Sundays, and listen to the sermon, read spiritual books, and let it be a pleasure to converse on religious subjects. Remember also the words which Mary addresses to all. Whatsoever he shall say to you, do ye. Live according to the teaching of Christ, for not the knowledge, but the observance of that doctrine leads to salvation. And consider well these words spoken by his divine lips. The servant who knew the will of his Lord, and hath not prepared, and did not according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. Christ is also our king. As king, the prophets announced him. Thus, Zachary says of him, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout for joy, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king will come to thee, the just and savior. And Isaiah says, His empire shall be multiplied, and there shall be no end of peace. He shall sit upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to establish it and strengthen it with judgment and with justice from henceforth and forever. The wise men from the east also called him king, for their question was, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? Jesus Christ calls himself a king, for when Pilate asked him, Art thou a king? He answered, 
thou sayest I, that I am a king. Christ is the king of all kings. His kingdom is not limited as the kingdoms of the rulers of this world. It extends over all the earth, yea, over heaven. Angels and men render homage to him. His creatures bend their knees before him and pay him the tribute of adoration, which is his due. His dominion is not for a few brief transitory years, but will endure when time shall be no more. His church, wherein he rules, will exist to the end of time, and the gates of hell shall never prevail against her, because she is the pillar and the ground of truth. Even when this material world shall perish, the church will continue to exist, for on the last day the church militant will be transformed into the church triumphant, and in this latter Christ will reign forever. Christ's kingdom, however, is not a temporal but a spiritual kingdom, whence he repeatedly declared to Pilate, My kingdom is not of this world. It is in the world, but not of the world. He does not rule according to the manner of temporal rulers by external power. He has nothing to do with the bodies of men and their temporal interests. He punishes not with imprisonment and death, distributes no badges of honor, neither does he reward with lucrative positions, dignities, and marks of esteem. His kingdom is a spiritual one which extends to all men through faith and grace. The riches and dignities of which his subjects become participants consist in justification and sanctification, and in being made children of God and heirs of heaven. The punishments which he inflicts are the withdrawals of his graces, exclusion from heaven, and eternal damnation. Christ, therefore, is a king infinitely more powerful, more exalted, and more venerable than all the kings and rulers of the earth. Therefore, he hath on his garments and on his thigh written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And Mary is the mother of this king. Who can comprehend her dignity? How paltry, how insignificant are the mothers of earthly sovereigns in comparison with her? Whilst the mothers of the kings of the world are generally held in veneration only by their subjects, Mary is highly venerated and esteemed throughout the whole world, and whilst their splendor passes away in time, Mary's praise, like that of her son, resounds from generation to generation. My dear Christian, recognize Christ as your king and be subject to him. His kingdom is not of this world. As a citizen of this kingdom, do not set your heart and affections upon the world and its deceitful pleasures and goods. Look above, frequently contemplate the glorious kingdom which your king has prepared for you, and live in such a manner that at your departure from this world you may be admitted into that happy place. Control your sensual desires and passions, despise the low appetites of the flesh, and deny yourselves everything that you cannot enjoy and possess without violating your duty as a Christian. Frequently meditate on the words of Christ, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, and take up his cross, and follow me. And finally, Christ is our high priest. The principal office of the priest is to offer sacrifice. Christ, too, has offered a sacrifice to his heavenly Father. He has offered himself upon the altar of the cross. In order to apply the fruits of his bloody sacrifice to the people of all times, he offers himself daily in an unbloody manner by the hands of priests in the sacrifice of the Mass to the end of time. The priesthood of Christ is infinitely exalted above the priesthood of the old law. Christ needeth not daily, as other priests, the Jewish priests, to offer up sacrifices first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. For this he did once by offering up himself. He is a high priest, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. He does not, 
as the Jewish priests offer up animals, but himself, whence the apostle writes, not by the blood of goats or of calves, but by his own blood, he entered once into the sanctuary, having obtained eternal redemption. Finally, his priesthood is not transient, as the Jewish, but endures forever, again and again renewing the sacrifice consummated on Calvary through the priest of the new law. Hence the prophet says of him, Thou art a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. The mother of this high priest is Mary. Like him, she is full of mercy toward sinners, ever intent upon making them partake of the fruit of the sacrificial blood of her priestly son and save their souls. Cardinal Antonelli, prime minister to Pius IX, was for a long time the object of the hatred of certain revolutionists who had sworn to take his life. The wretch who was ordered to thrust the poniard into the heart of the cardinal awaited him one evening in the corner of the Vatican in order to execute his murderous project. Antonelli was returning from a conversation with his holiness when the bandit rushed upon him and was about to dispatch him with his deadly weapon. But protected by heaven, Antonelli parried the fatal steel and cried for help. The guards hastened to the spot and the murderer was apprehended, delivered to the authorities, and after a fair, impartial trial, condemned to death. Many pious men visited him in prison in order to afford him the consolations of religion, but he only laughed at their entreaties and remained obstinate. Father Anthony, the general of the Trinitarians, hearing of their failure, went himself to see him and endeavored to move this hardened heart by the representation of the terrible torments which were awaiting him in eternity. If he would not be converted, but all to no avail. Meanwhile, night came on, but the zealous religious remained. He hoped against hope and never ceased to implore God to have mercy on this unfortunate creature. He showed him the medal he wore, representing the Holy Virgin, her heart transfixed with a sword, and holding the infant Jesus in her arms. Ah, said the criminal, if I had only thrust my dagger into Antonelli's heart as it has transfixed in the heart of Mary, I would die a hero, whilst now a criminal's death awaits me. A day dawned, and the doomed man, accompanied by the priest, was led to the place of execution. Before they reached the spot, they entered a little wayside chapel, the last stopping place in life before entering eternity. The priest once more invoked Mary and conjured her with tears in his eyes to have pity upon this soul, redeemed by the blood of her divine Son. He then approached the poor sinner, showed him once more the picture of the dolorous mother, and said, Look at least upon this picture before you die. The wretch took it into his hand, looked at it, and then said with a loud voice, Holy Virgin Mary, your ardent love has melted my icy heart. You have conquered my guilty resistance. O Father, help me to reconcile myself with my judge before I appear before him. He confessed with the signs of the most heartfelt compunction, received Holy Communion, and courageously mounted the gibbet. Before delivering his head to the executioner, he said to his fervent guide, Father, let me look at the picture of our Divine Mother once more. Let me give it one last kiss. After this act of living faith and touching love, he gave himself up to the executioner. Thus, through the mediation of Mary, this poor sinner was brought to repentance, and as we have every reason to hope, rescued from eternal perdition. My dear Christian, do not forget to venerate the Blessed Virgin daily and to recommend yourself to her mercy. Ask her to plead your cause with her divine Son and to obtain for you grace in life and at the hour of death. As often as you assist at the sacrifice of the Mass, beseech her to obtain for you the grace that you may participate in the fruits of the Holy Sacrifice. Remember also, at every Mass, unfortunate sinners who are in great danger of perdition, and pray fervently to Mary to obtain for them 
through her intercession with Jesus, who offers himself on the altar, the grace of repentance.